So Head in the Clouds refers to some work that I um, have been uh, working on over the last couple of years uh, in conjunction with Thomas Ekaitz Bonten, also from uh, Copenhagen, and with Guillermo Rangal, um, which is a, a cloud-based way of visualizing phage genomes. And feet in the ground refers to the uh, uh, ecological framework that I hope to, um, which I will expand upon in this talk. And uh, at, at the front of my talk, I also want to thank my uh, the postdocs and the PhD students who I've listed here, who've generated the data uh, that uh, I will present and that's led to the ideas, and also my other phage files, Lester. So this is what we would like to do um, when it comes to figuring out which phages we want to use to treat specific pathogens, whether they be human or animal, crop or aquaculture pathogens. We'd like to be able to take the bacteria that we want to be able to target, and there are all the different types of phages that do can infect, and which types are going to be the best therapeutically. So here is a Klebsiella uh, image imposed upon what, it, which, what is actual data of all the Klebsiella phages that have been um, isolated and deposited in the different databases. So Klebsiella phages isolated on Klebsiella are shown in that russet brown colour, and the, the size of the circle is representative of the size of the genome. So we can see, for example, there are two groups of large Klebsiella phages, several smaller groups of, um, uh, of several groups of smaller phages, and then several groups of even smaller phages again. Now, where there's a line uh, between those different uh, phages, they have some genetic relationship to each other. And you can see I've drawn a green cloud over the phages at the top and a pink cloud over the ones at the bottom. And what they represent are uh, phages that have certain features. So when you look at the genomes of those phages, the ones at the top have many genes involved in nucleotide metabolism, and the ones at the bottom have um, polymerases in them. So perhaps those phages have it by virtue of not having uh, um, every gene in common, but by having key genes, maybe infecting bacteria in slightly different ways. And can we use this information to actually uh, look at some commonalities between different phage groups when we're trying to understand what phages might be the best to use therapeutically. So um, what we are doing also at the moment, our group and many other groups, can, we can see that when we use phages in a therapeutic setting, this is now some data that Anisha is currently in the, um, writing up and it's from some, a pig trial that she did with salmonella phages. And what you can see from this data is when you feed uh, phages to pigs uh, that have been challenged with salmonella, the, the phages that have had, sorry, the pigs that have had the phages have less uh, salmonella cells in every component of their gut. And we can also see that those phages are capable of replicating. So when um, we just give animals phages, we can then retrieve those phages from those animals, but when we give phages, uh, sorry, <laughs> pigs, <laughs> the phages, and we infect them with salmonella, we can see that those phages are replicating at the site of infection, which is one of the properties we really want to use when it comes to using phages therapeutically. But the question remains as to which phages are the best. So can we find phages that will e um, be even better than those ones that we used in that trial? And can we find phages that will be better at um, amplification in situ? And can we use this ecological knowledge of knowing different types of transcriptional takeover strategy to actually allow us to find those phages? So this is what we'd like to be able to do. So this, <laughs> this here is a picture. It's one of my favorite pictures that my dad actually took of, of, of me and my, my two boys when they were young. Uh, he just told us to sit down and see how many species of plants we could identify. And this is a chalk grassland. It's really beautiful, the chalk grasslands in, in, the, in Hampshire. And because the environment is limited by water, it's a very stressed environment and you get a high diversity of plants. So without moving at all, we moved to where my jackets are thrown in the grass over there, we could find 30 species of plants. So I can get my botany book out and I can work out why, what those plants are and why they're there. <laughs> so this is what we'd like to be able to do with phages, but there is no book yet uh, written. We have, to, we have to write it. Um, so even if you go to areas that, um, uh, that we know are full of phages that are suitable for our purposes. So on the left side, actually, this is also in Hampshire, but at the bottom of the hill in the, in the, um, in the estuarine mudflats, I know that they're really full of phages that target, for example, C. diff. Um, but even if you were to see those phages, you wouldn't be able to tell which were the ones that were useful. 
Um, so what we'd like to be able to do, uh, as I said, is take okay, all, the, all the pages that uh, we know target specific groups. So here we have um, a, a, a Pseudomonas cloud. I thought I'd show you this data because uh, many of you work on Pseudomonas and you can see if you look closely, the BDI amongst you will probably recognize your, we try to label the most famous, uh, the best known examples, different Pseudomonas pages. So we can see the, these are all the, um, um, all, 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 all the different clusters of related um, pseudomonas phages. So where you have a, a cluster, there'll be a type, the type page will be here, and then all of the other different um, phages that have a relationship to it are, are within that specific cluster, but their phages don't uh, share any relationship between, um, between clusters. So as I said, what we'd like to be able to do is see which clusters have got which features and see how we can uh, try, try to get this link, be able to link this information to phenotype and how those phages will work in a therapeutic setting. So what ecological uh, framework might we use to do this? Well, I want to share with you Grimes, our plant ecological framework. So he is a botanist who was in, in about the 1970s proposed that you could classify all plants according to three axes. So these are, um, in a way, three different philosophical concepts. There's the axis of this, there's the, the notion of being a competitor. So a, a competitor plant is a plant that grows um, uh, this nice, robust infrastructure. So it grows large roots, um, these um, horrible stinging metal leaves that you can brush against and get hurt by. And eventually, when they've got their infrastructure of roots and leaves, they'll then go to reproduction. Other plants um, are really good at coping with stress. So in that short grassland is wild thyme, lots of little, and there are many other really tiny plants that are just very economical with resources. And the third philosophical concept that Grimes uses is the concept of a ruderal. So a ruderal is a plant that just um, can cope with a lot of disturbance. So for example, poppy is always a symbol of war, and that's because they, they can survive that, that disturbance of the trenches. So Grimes, um, came up with this, as I said, in the 70s, and said you can classify every plant in the UK as being classified according to um, having one or more of these properties. And there's a book, actually, I meant to have it as a prop, but I've got a book on my shelf where 30 years later he defended this um, uh, this, this framework and it's been used ever since and in different ways to understand plant communities. So I thought, well, rather than uh, reinventing the wheel in terms of ecological frameworks, let's see if this works for phages. It's so conceptually, I think it does, that you can imagine that a sea phage, uh, if we take our analogies of plants, would be a phage that would be effective when um, bacterial conditions are good. So it'd have a large proportion of early, um, of, of genes perhaps expressed at the beginning of their cycle so they could make this big infrastructure like you saw with a nettle plant. Um, in, um, so essentially they would spend some time tuning that bacterial cell to make the things that they need to be able to undergo the, uh, the full viral morphogenesis. Now, in contrast, a, um, an S phage would be one that would be able to infect bacteria that were stressed and uh, that they were deprived of nutrients, for example, and they'd be able to respond to a wide range of conditions. And then by analogy as well, those R phages would be something that could cope with the fluctuating conditions. So for example, brackish seawater, they'd leave sort of in and out quite quickly. So um, that was the idea. <laughs> then I, then, um, I was thinking, well, how can we, how can we actually impose, like, what traits can we actually measure? How would, we, how, where, where would we start with this framework in phages? So these are, I've listed here the things that you can measure in phages. I'm sure many of you measure all the time things like morphology, specific behaviors, the um, behaviors, the arrangements of the of, of the genome, whether they're temperate or lytic. We can look for key genes that we know um, seem to have specific behaviors uh, such as tRNAs, polymerases. Um, one thing we can't do easily is look for the same gene in every phage because unlike bacteria they don't have a, a common marker but what they all do by virtue of taking over the bacteria is that they all must take over that bacterial metabolism to make phages so I thought well can we actually use this to um, a, a, as a sort of good as a measurable objective starting point so we know that when a phage infects a bacteria there are generally three phases of transcription. Initially, they interact with their hosts, and then they, um, then they, uh, after they've uh, done those early interactions, they then um, start to replicate. And then we have viral morphogenesis. So what I was thinking was, if our competitive phages, for example, they would perhaps have a large proportion of genes expressed early. So they would be here on this triangle. 
Um, and our stress stage uh, would be one, as I said, that's economical uh, with resources and would allow things to be able to express in, in, in the middle. So for those um, stress ones conditions are hard, they would perhaps, so they would get going uh, early, but then they would be able to uh, tune the machinery to what they needed. So they would perhaps have a lot of genes expressed in the middle. And then a ruderal phage would be one that sort of got, just didn't really hang around, but it just got to replication quite quickly uh, when conditions were good. So it wouldn't need a lot of this downstream armory. So here are three phages to illustrate these points. Uh, the first phage listed uh, would be mapped, it says equal, more or less equal proportions of phages, so that would map here. Uh, the second phage is a cyanobacterial phage, and, and that does actually, that, 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 that phage maps here. So these are genes that, phages that have their transcriptions profiled. Um, so that, that would be in this stressful conditions. And then the final phage I'm showing you by analogy is this uh, T5 in the coli phage, and that um, maps right up here because it's, then she just has early and late phases. So we then were able to take um, all phages that had their transcriptomes looked at, so it's 42 phages, and how we look to see how they fitted. Now I'm just showing you the data here for three types of phages. Um, so we've got the cyanobacterial phages in green, the E. coli phages in purple, and the pseudomonas phages in red. Now the first thing to notice, and actually it was even more apparent when I, I took, I just stripped out the data so it'd be less confusing to look at, but the, the phages do fill up um, every triangle within the, within the triangle framework. And largely, actually, the data seems to make sense. So if we look here, all of those cyanobacteria phages that we would expect to see in, um, in that stress corner, because the cyanobacteria live in very stressful conditions, high light, the nutrients, and actually the phages do seem to have a lot of genes expressed in that early stage, so that makes sense. Now the pseudomonas phages are kind of all over the shop. Uh, <laughs> there are many, there are many uh, of these different sub-triangles. Uh, interestingly, the one in the middle, this um, URA, according to um, Bob Lastel, who did the original work on its transcription, is a terrible phage therapeutically because it, it, just, it just doesn't really work very well. And you can imagine that maybe a bit like plants, phages that are good at everything are, are perhaps less good ultimately as, as therapeutic phages. And it could easily be that when we're selecting phages for things like broad host range, strong virulence, we're actually perhaps missing the key phages that might be um, ultimately more, more useful. So phages that are good at coping in, in stressful conditions. So the very first talk yesterday, like with the L forms, the, the point there was made that actually T4 couldn't infect those stationary phases, but um, other phages that she tested could. So, um, and again, the, the E. coli phages that have been looked at are um, also in different parts of, the, of this triangle and it seems to link in with their behavior. So, um, going forward, uh, I think we're at a really exciting time to test these ideas, I think, and take them further. Um, clearly, what we're doing in our lab now is, is taking known cocktails of phages that we, where we, of our cocktails that we've developed and actually seeing how they then fit to do more transcriptional analysis. But I think what's going to be really um, good to add to this framework is being able to add traits um, onto it. So the, the transcriptional profiling will just be the starting point where we can perhaps group phages. And then we can see what traits map to those types of phages. Um, proteomics is going to be key because at the moment we just largely say, well, we don't recognize many of the, the, the genes, but um, by proteomics yeah. we'll be able to get a structure and therefore function, which will lead us to understanding the mechanisms of behavior. And also, um, there's huge amounts of information to be gleaned from metabolomics. Uh, clearly, when we've got this data, we'll be able to, um, uh, we, we need decent and silico frameworks to be able to put this information together and uh, test the traits. So um, I'm just going to show you a little bit, put a little bit of flesh on the bone before I, uh, uh, at the, uh, towards the end of my talk. So in terms of the proteomics and the structural biology, I'm showing you some data now that um, my very talented uh, PhD student, um, or who's now a postdoc at Lincoln, um, Ahmed Dua, gathered over a long period of time. He figured out what the tail fiber receptors were, um, tail fiber binding proteins, were for our Clostridium difficile phage, CDHS1. 
Now, it took him a very long time to do this because any of you that have worked with phage structural proteins, particularly from some phages, know it, this work is not trivial. So after, um, at, at towards the, um, finally, towards the end of his PhD, Ahmed was able to make the um, phage proteins soluble. He was able to do a lot, lot of uh, phenotypic assays to show that they were the tail fibers. He was able to um, generate structures, uh, or crystals that could be diffracted. But he had to use a, 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 a fairly complicated set of um, proteomic techniques to do this, structural biological techniques, like selenomethionine replacement, for example. Anyway, eventually you've got to the structure of the tail fibers of our C. diff protein. Now, it is, um, these, it's an unusual structure. It's a, made of alpha helices with these beta sheets that are the, the head, the binding protein. Um, so this work is about to be published. But meanwhile, um, uh, what, one thing we've been having a bit of a play with, and it's been mentioned a couple of times in the symposium so far, is looking at alpha folds. So this is um, a, able, a, a, a program written by Google and DeepMind. Um, and we've started to apply these algorithms to phage proteins, which are so un unknown and uncharacterized. And uh, look at this, this is actually, we were able to predict really, really well the uh, structure of our C. diff tail fibers. So I was initially thinking, oh no, poor Ahmed did all this work, but, and, we, and you know we can predict it. But actually, we have the experimental validation that these predictions are good compared to other tools. And I think going forward, this was this we can see here. This is the structural structure structure room <laughs> of our um, of our phage. And, and going forward, we'll be able to actually be able to look for for, for proteins that have certain features um, that we can relate to certain ecological traits. So I see this as being a, an extremely exciting move in terms of. Uh, of sort of the, the next generation of tools to actually understand the mechanisms of how our phages work as we develop them. And another thing I think is, is really cool is looking at the metabolism of phages. Most people, when they, they do uh, metabolomic studies, they do liquid chromatography mass spec. Now, Fran uh, uh, Hodges, a PhD student who's just uh, finishing her writing up in my lab, she actually did GCMS, so she put her samples, her phage infected samples, um, into a chamber and she detected the volatiles that came off those phages. Now, I'm just going to show you one slide of her data, um, uh, which is here. And what you can see is there are, um, this is a principal component analysis, two different hosts, two different phages, pink and a pink phage and a green phage, and aerobically and anaerobically. And all I want you to see is that the blobs are in different places in the different, in the different conditions, whether they're aerobic or anaerobic. And if we know what, metabol what metabolites are produced um, as, associated with particular features, I think metabolomic screening could be a really, really good shortcut to choosing phages that we're interested in choosing. In, in using. So clearly when we've got the individual traits of different phages and understood the types, we'll be able to then also make ecologically informed cocktails. Um, so hope, in conclusion really, hopefully I've shown you um, the utility of being able to visualize the, the genomes in this Clyde's way that we've been working on, which is a um, at the beginning of my talk. And uh, hopefully I, I've tried to tell you how we want to impose on this um, ecological strategies such as this CSR strategy, which I think may work well. If not, we can use this to find better ones. Um, and I think it's quite exciting in terms of the omics traits that we'll be able to impose within this framework. And I'll leave you with this um, analogy, which is I think that at the moment when it comes to phage therapy, I almost feel it's like if, it's, if, 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 if a cocktail is the equivalent of a cottage garden, what we do is we take all the phages we can find and we kind of, you know, we, 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 we then do endless screening to see what are the features we want. But we don't, it would be like going to a cottage garden and taking all the seeds you can find and seeing what, 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 what plants grew where. We don't need to do it because we know, you know which plants like a south facing wall will climb, who, what size they are. So it's these functional types. I think when we get a handle on them with phages, it will be really useful to have these universal handles to um, be able to, to use phages more cleanly. So hopefully together going forward, we'll be able to write this book. Um, and then just a, a final um, advert I just wanted to mention for the, the um, the journal phage we're actually having a special issue in phage informatics uh, and if people have um, papers in any of these fields please feel free to um, send them our way for the special so that Clyde's paper is going to be in the first set of uh, first special issue we're going to have a split special issue depending on uh, when you have papers ready you could you could you feel, feel free to, to, to pop them our way and that would be a should be a nice collection okay with that I will uh, finish and thank you for your attention <laughs>